Okay, let's start. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I hope you're in good spirits. Uh, today, today's talk is about the observability tools. So normally, that these are the tools that help you quickly understand what your program is doing, how it's behaving, and can also help you determine possibly the cause of some of the issues. So I think this talk should be nice and a really good introduction to many engineers because I see that most people are actually stuck with GDB and printf, so that's like the pinnacle of software development. But we don't have to do it like that. Uh, short info about me, I am Ivica Bogosavljevic. I come from Serbia, I do software application, I'm an application performance engineer. That means I'm trying to make software run faster. I work also as an external expert, so if you have problems with software performance, you can call, contact me. And also write a lot about the software performance on my blog, so this is the website on there. Okay. So, as I already said, most, many people can, will use exclusively either debuggers or printfs, so, or both of them, when they're doing, uh, so, yes? So most people will use most of the time debuggers and printfs, which are good tools in themselves. I don't have anything against them. But is that all? Is there anything else? And uh, here we talk about the observability tools. Observability tools are various tools that help you get uh, more information about your program. It is, imagine it in a way like you you're looking your program under a microscope. You're seeing some details that you were, would otherwise miss if you don't have the appropriate tooling. Uh, if you're starting on an unfamiliar code base, and we know that engineers change jobs very often, like every few years, you want to understand which code is important. And they say to you, like, read the code, but the code is five million lines. So, you want to understand what part of the code you want to read, so you want to know which functions are important and which are not. Uh, you want to know the timeline, how, how the program moves from one function to another. You want to explore how the program uses memory, when it goes up, when it goes down, what are these particular moments when that happens. You're interested in hardware efficiency. How good is your program with regards to utilizing the hardware? Uh, you want to know how your program interacts with the operating systems system. What kind of what kind of system calls does it make? So we're going to uh, uh, investigate that here. You can also use observability tools to to debug unusual or weird behaviors. And I made all, so this is a practical session in the sense I will be working a lot in the terminal, and you can find all the examples here at this uh, in GitHub. Okay, so the first tool, so uh, just before we begin, a, a few, no, few notes. All the tools here are Linux tools. So if you're Windows, you're using Windows, I assume there are equivalent tools on Windows, just I'm not using Windows, so I cannot give you any information about that. But I guess at least half of you are using Linux here, so this is what I see most common. Uh, okay, so uh, let's start. So the first one are called flame graphs, and I've seen a few people present them in their talks yesterday. So for those who are unfamiliar, this is a flame graph. It's called flame because lo it looks like this, this color. And earlier they were like in a, in a, in a shades of orange, so it, they looked like flame. And these are basically stack traces, here, as, as you can see. So the function start call, calls libc, start main, calls main constraints, code calls read filters, and so on. Okay. Now, how do you get this? That's the question. In order to get this on Linux, you would use Linux tool called perf. Perf is a uh, Linux, uh, Linux profiler, and it is a really powerful tool, and it can gather a various information about, about your program. The scope of that would be probably one full conference, and we're not interested. We're not interested about the perf itself. We're interested in how to get this, these lovely graphs. So let me show you. So if you want to get this uh, grad you, graph, you need, okay, let's just, before, before beginning, I will use Lulesh. Lulesh is an example program from the scientific computing that, you can that I'm using in many examples here to illustrate how the tools work. Now, 
uh, Lulesh is already compiled on my system with the, the, the debug flags because many t tools will need debug flags in order to, pr to, give, to give good information. Now I use this command. I don't, see, I don't think you see it here fully. Okay, so it's perf record. I'm inviting perf. Uh, uh, the perf is calling my Lulesh binary, which is here. And I'm telling it to collect backtrace information, so stack traces, and I'm telling it to do 99, uh, 99 times per second. So this is, F is the frequency. Okay, and in the second line, uh, line I'm, I'm calling speed scope, which is this tool, and we will, uh, we will see what the tool does. Okay, so I'm gonna do it bash, bash, zero, one. It takes like a few seconds. Now I have problems on this computer with, with uh, speed scope because only on this computer, only in Chrome, it doesn't render correctly, but it renders in Firefox. Okay, so perf has finished. And now it's converting to SpeedScope in format that SpeedScope can understand. SpeedScope is a really good tool, so I'm going to say a few words about it. Uh, SpeedScope works with C++, but it also works with other languages like Java, .NET, Ruby on Rails, JavaScript, whatever. So it has support to, it has support to, um, to read and display this information from many languages. Now I'm going to need, this thing doesn't work here correctly, see? Although it's, okay. So this is, this is the speed scope output. And here I see that there are two threads. One is the perf exec thread, and the second one is the Lulesh thread. I'm not interested in perf exec thread. What I'm actually interested in is the Lulesh thread, and let's investigate it here, what happens. So we have here three, uh, three types of visualization. So one is the time order visualization, the second one is the left heavy, and the third one is the sandwich. So let's go with the time order. So these are stacked traces, but they're, they're um, ordered in time. And you can see here, I can zoom. So this is the, 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 gray, the gray field. You see up, it's the whole timeline. The program took uh, about 20, 22 seconds, I think. And, uh, uh, and uh, um, you can zoom in and zoom out and see what the program was doing through, throughout the time. So you can see that the, what was actually happening. Now, if you look at it like this, it just, just looks messy. But if you zoom in a little bit, then you see what was going on, actually. So the function main was call, calling Lagrange leapfrog. And then you see here that it's Lagrange nodal, Lagrange elements, Lagrange nodal, Lagrange elements, and so on. So it was going for a really long time. And you start to understand what the program is actually doing. So it's just calling one function, two functions, um, it, uh, one after another, one after another. So interchangeably, it's just switching between two functions. Yes? So if you look at it, if you look at it, you see here that uh, the fun and you can see also what other functions were called and if the, they were in line and so on. So I think you get the picture. Uh, is there anything that's not clear here? Yes. Is it a fixed uh, period of time? Or so can I miss something that is very quick? Or? It will miss something that is very quick. So it's sampling the program. It's not related to speed scope. It's related to the perf. So the way the perf does, and perf does by sampling, it samples every 99 times per second, OK? Uh, next thing in speed scope, you have this called left heavy. Now, it's really similar to the previous one, but the previous one was in time. So how the program was behaving in time. And this is uh, different because it tells you which functions were actually consuming the most time. So you see that the most, 
99% of the time was spent in main, but not in the main itself. It was spent in the other function that the main, that the main called, like this one or this one. So this thing is useful to know where your program was spending time. And this is what actually what classical profilers do. Okay? So this is the, the first one. The first one was, was interesting because, because you wanted to see how the program behaves. And you needed to zoom in, zoom out a bit. This one tells you where it is spending time. The last tab in the speed scope, it's called sandwich. And sandwich actually has, for each function, it lists, like the, uh, it, it, it lists the run time. So you have two columns. One is total and one is self. Self is how much the program has spent in the function itself. And total is how much the program has spent in the, the, the function itself and all the other functions that were called. So if you look at it here, for example, you can sort by either by self or by total. So if you sort by total, you see that the main spent most of the time. So it's 20 point, uh, 21 seconds. But, but, if you, but if you're interested in improving speed, in that case, you, will, you want to sort by self and see that this function, for example, took 4.01 seconds. OK, that's about speed scope. Anything else? Sorry? Uh, you can, uh, so speed scope itself, it's not a problem. Perf, and perf, it, it, perf can attach to a running process. Uh, it lowers it, uh, so it's again related to perf. It lower, lowers the performance, but, uh, but not much, like about 2 or 3%. Yes? Can you profile an Android application to this? Oh, that's a good question. So I, I think I, I, I cannot answer that, but since the Android is built on Linux, then that means that, uh, that means that probably the perf infrastructure is available there as well. So you would need to look it up, but I guess it's possible, especially because Speedscope can take information from any sources, not perf only. Perf is just what is interesting to me on Linux. Yes? I think it will, uh, I think it, uh, that's a good question. I think it will appear, no, it will appear as one line, not several lines. So this is, these are cumulative times. Okay? Yes? <coughs> yes. Multi-threaded is a bit more complex. Why is the uh, problem with the multi-threading? I mean, the per perf will record all the threads and you will see in this list green, you will see all the threads. You can record for the whole system. That also works and displayed with speed scope. Now the problem with, with multi-threading is because in these graphs you don't see how thread interact with one another. One thread is waiting for another and you don't see that. With functions you do see still because another function cannot start be before this function ends. But in multi-threading that can happen. So with multi-threading this can also be helpful but you need a bit more understanding of, of what's going on with the program itself, like what is the master thread. In all systems you have the master thread, so what is the master thread, how it communicates, you need to understand that. Unfortunately, I'm not aware of any tools that can help you do that, so to understand, to see which, which um, thread is blocked waiting for which thread, so I don't know if you can do that. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I use perf a lot, I like perf very much and uh, when you're starting a new, new work on a new code base, if you are, if you are uh, interested in where your program is spending time and how it actually works, this is a good place to start. So these are all the things you need, so this is the reference, how you, to, you can call it, but just visit Speedscope and you have all the information there. Okay. Okay, next, next things are called the heap profilers. In our case, uh, a, I use heap track. Heap track is available on Linux. So m m about half of the tools are visual in nature. So, and I like visualization because like, there is a proverb saying uh, one image is worth a thousand words. So actually this is true for when you're trying to understand such, such, such things. So what, uh, what heap profilers are used for is uh, they're using to observe how your program allocates, deallocates memory. What is it doing with the memory? And uh, you can debug memory consumption. Sometimes it is, sometimes it is a good practice. Uh, sometimes you have memory problems and you want to debug them. Okay. Uh, so, so.
So heap track is available in repositories in most Linux distributions. Sorry, 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 sorry. In most Linux distributions, it's available in repositories. I'm using again Lulish. Uh, you call heap track like this. So you heap track and the binary name. And when it's done, it produces some kind of output in the ZST format. And then you, you analyze it with this command. So let's run it and see what happens. Again, we need to wait about 22 seconds. So heap track works by attaching to malloc three and free. So there is this LD preload mechanism when you can replace the weak symbols. Malloc and free are weak symbols. So you can replace them and this is what heap track does. And when it's running, instead of calling regular malloc and free, it calls the heap track version and which does some statistical processing and saves everything at it can display these nice graphs. Okay, so here is the output of heap track. Uh, it, it's really nice. So because it has like many, 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 many nice things, I'm just gonna go through them really, really quickly. So you have the summary tab, which gets, gives you where, what are the peak contributions. So where most memory was allocated, it can tell you uh, where most memory allocation happened, where most temporary allocation happened. Temporary allocation is an allocation you alloc a block of memory and you free it Im immediately after the afterwards. You don't alloc on or free anything in between. So this is a temporary and it's a good uh, candidate to become a stack allocation. Okay, so you have this bottom up, uh, uh, bottom up diagrams and you see here that uh, this function has made the most allocations and most temporary allocations. But then if you look it up, you see that this is actually a wrapper for uh, malloc, and you see that it was called by this function and this function and so on. Ah, uh -huh, uh -huh, sorry, I cannot zoom in. So because this is a, uh, uh, then you have this caller call e. So you click on a function like this, and it says you. So uh, the caller was so the function was main. The caller was lib start main, and the call is that that allocated the most memory was this domain. Domain, domain, uh, basic opera, basic stream, and uh, Lagrange uh, uh, leapfrog, and so on. You have this top down, and you have flame graphs, so you can see visually where, um, which which uh, which uh, function was allocating the most memory. So it's really similar to the flame graphs; it just goes upwards. So you see that double allocate was actually allocating the most memory, and here is who called the double. So calc our glass control for elements and so on. Um, you have here consumed graph and consumed graph, uh, so how your program works, it allocates the allocates, allocates the allocates, allocates the allocates, and there is some peak value, like peak value of your program is 120 megabytes. In this case, peak value is about 20 megabytes, and you see it was allocating the allocating, allocating the allocating, this is how it was going. But the, the, the total memory consumption never went over 20 megabytes. And you have here the allocations. So how many, so this is uh, the first, the previous graph was consumed. So it was calculating freeze, free calls to free. And this graph doesn't. So it just, it, it just keeps growing. So if it grows really steeply, that means you're allocating a lot of memory. If it doesn't, that means that you are, you're not alloc allocating that much memory. And actually this is useful. If, you, if your program is doing a lot of allocations, and freeing and allocations and freeing, even though it's not consuming a lot of memory, it is putting a lot of pressure on the memory subsystem, okay? And it, you can also track temporary allocations and sizes. And you see here that the, most of the allocations were done by, by in chunks that are larger than one kilobyte. Okay, questions? And the allocations, what is all that rainbow color? Ah, they like rainbows, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, to be honest, I, I, I re recall that when, you're, when, you put, when you put the mouse like this, it used to tell you the function uh, where this allocation was happening, but I'm not seeing it, I'm not seeing it here anymore. I don't know what, what, what's the difference. So it was actually the information was useful, but something changed, I don't know what. Uh, the question, am I talking too fast? Okay. But basically, you can uh, repeat the question so uh, someone that will show it the YouTube will 
Aha, okay, 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 okay. Uh, questions about heap track. So these, uh, these memory he, uh, heap trackers or heap profilers are actually useful tools and you should definitely have one in your toolbox. They exist for Windows, they exist for Linux, I guess for embedded systems as well. And when you have memory problems, having this information can be really useful. Yes? Uh, you can, you can, uh, you can. Uh, if you have a Linux-based embedded system, you can record it there and then copy to your computer and then use the visualizer here on the computer. Okay. So I think there is a nice talk about heap track. I put a link there. Uh, you need to compile your program with debug symbols. Your recording. I already explained how you do it. It's quite simple. Okay. Moving on. Coverage tools. So I guess most people are familiar with coverage tools. Coverage tools are used in testing and they tell you if, if all of your lines are covered by tests. So see, you see here this default line. So you see the source code on the right and on the left you see the numbers and this is the number this, this, this statement was executed. I don't think this is the exact number. I think it's a, like approximate number. But you see here the default was never executed. So these are used in testing, but they can also be useful when you're developing because it can tell you which, pro which part of the, if you look at the function, it, it can tell you how, how um, it can tell you um, which parts of the function are more important, which parts of the less, what, what was executed, in, in, what if statements were executed, what switch statements were executed, and so on. Okay, so these are the coverage tools. I guess most of you are familiar with them, but I think, I think in, my, in, my, in my experience, they're also really, really uh, useful. So uh, how does it work? First, you need to compile your program with debug symbols and with coverage information. So there is this slash slash coverage, coverage uh, compiler flag that goes to the compiler. Next, you need to, you, you run your program and uh, you run your program and the program uh, generates a coverage information as a separate file. Uh, and then you call this, I, I think this is, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what these commands do, it was a long time ago, but basically this will like collect several information and, and create one file and this one will generate HTML and then you open it. Why do you think it's not exact? It doesn't look like it is something. And, and uh, that's, that's the, the, the question I was asking myself. So you see, why is it always double zeros? Mm -hmm. You see, it all ends in double zeros. It's maybe just the tool was displaying it, but <laughs> I would expect since the coverage tool actually work by putting, uh, uh, um, uh, putting a counter at each basic block so they can count everywhere where there is an if, where is else, where is a for loop, it counts. But either the tools don't do that or, or, or something else because I don't see here the, the, I would accept, you don't expect two zeros everywhere. Maybe this is the nature of the program. Yes, yes, or the visualizer, that's also possible. So the coverage tools come with this really nice visual visualizer. Okay, let's let's uh, run them. Again, 20 seconds delay. Yes. Yes, yes, so I added the coverage uh, compilation flag. You specify to Plank or GCC the coverage compilation flag and then when you run a program which is compiled in this way, you get the coverage information as an additional file. And you get this really nice report and it's, uh, it's per file and what I'm interested in is, is this, sorry, per directory and I'm interested in this Lulesh directory and then you get the files and I'm interested in Lulesh CC because this is most of the, where my, most of my code comes in. And let's, if, so he, you, you see here example. So this is some kind of function called time increment. And you see here that if was, so the function executed this if almost every time. 
so the code in this if was executed almost every time the, 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 the function entered. So this, this condition was, let's say, likely. <laughs> And uh, here you have, a, you have a condition which was executed only 8 out of 930 ta uh, 30 times. So this condition wasn't executed at all. Uh, you can use this to trace and see. May sometimes you have assumptions about, how, about your code that something was executed when actually it wasn't. Now the bad thing about this is that you need to recompile those, the, uh, your program. And recompiling large programs actually takes, can take a lot of time. So. It, applicability is so-so. I didn't write, but you can use perf to get similar, similar things, but only as a percentage, so not as an exact number. You can use perf. Uh, there is perf also has this information, but visualizing is, uh, requires a bit um, hacking, let's say. But, the, but you do it with perf, then it, it makes it possible to when you do it with perf, then uh, the, 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 you don't need to recompile your program. That's the good thing. Okay, questions? So why do you need to recompile because this coverage information is actually built into the binary. So every time there is a basic block, you, the compiler adds some code to record that this basic block was executed. Yes, this to the binary yes, yes. So, yes? Can you repeat again? Does it affect performance? Yes. So the, uh, the, the question was if the adding co coverage, coverage compiler flag affects performance. Yes, it does affect performance. Yes? So if you try to get a similar report uh, without uh, compiling the coverage, would you get like problem with inline functions, et cetera? <sighs> so templates are really, so the Templates are really nasty for these observability tools because you can have one function and it was it was like uh, it was uh, the code was like instantiated several times. So these are the problems. How the tools deal with them that actually depends on the tool. Inlining in principle works. So the compilers are aware that although the code is inline, it belongs to another function. I, I don't. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if that's the case. So with these kind of things, you can compile with those zeros, so there is no inlining. Uh, but for example, with the previous examples like the heap tr track or the perf, you actually want to compile with O3 or O2, and then there's with, that's where inlining go, comes into picture. No, but here it has to actually instrument in your code. It has to add new code track. Yes. But it can do, I, I, so this is not guesswork, but I think it can do inlining. It needs to uh, add instrumentation on the basic block level. Inlining should be in principle okay. It's possible. Does it do? I don't know, but it's possible. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> Kernel call uh, tracing. So. Kernel call, so you have your operating system and your program is asking for some services from the operating system. So these are system calls. And typically, you, if your program wants to read a file, if your pro program wants to send data over network, uh, if your program wants to allocate memory, like a big chunk of memory, it has to use system calls. And sometimes there are problems with actually with, with the system calls. So system calls create a large overhead and sometimes you want actually to understand uh, what are the, the your, what kind of what kind of um, uh, what kind of system calls does your program make and uh, how much time do they take and where are they made uh, sometimes that this can give you really a nice information about your system now um, so one of the biggest and simplest uh, kernel, call, kernel call tracer, system call tracer is called strace in Linux. I think similar thing exists in Windows as well. And uh, you can actually deduce a lot of information about strace, using strace about how your program behaves. Normally when your program is running, there are, it is running either in two modes. One is the user mode, 
but it is actually executing something that the compiler compiled, and the other one is the system mode, but it, when it, where the the operating system is doing something for the for the um, for the program, and uh, uh, yeah, so that's it. Now to understand what S trace is doing, uh, you actually need to understand the system calls. Now the good thing about system calls is that there aren't that many, and actually most programs like use at most 20 or 30 system calls and the names are quite uh, self-explanatory. So Futex is used for, uh, uh, m by Mutexes to, to, allow, to, allow to allow synchronization, so uh, a thread sleeps on a Futex. VRK is used for allocating memory. MMAP and AMMAP are also used for allocating memory. Read and write are used for write, uh, read, write, close are used for reading, writing, and closing files. Then you have this stat and F stat. It's just reading information about files, like what's the size, what's the content of this directory, and so on. So it's, it's not that complicated. Now I'm going to, uh, I think this was 0 04. OK, how does the S trace work? So with regards to S tra tracing system calls, uh, essentially, you don't need even debug information. You just run the program through, through the using S trace. Now, S trace has a few of command lines options. One is C. C means cumulative, and it will give you statistics. It's I I information about how much time in percentage was spent in each system call. Then you have running with no option. It will just print out all the system calls. And you see I'm redirecting it to a, to a file because the output can be huge. And there's this key K option. It will give you a system call, but it will also tell you which line was calling, which line in your program was making the system call. So this is useful for debugging. Now information about system calls are really, really, if you're creative, you can deduce a lot. I know a guy who took a system call read so he took the copy command in Linux. So there's copy command, and he attached to the copy command using stray, S trace. And because he was knowing that the read system call, and he was knowing how much bytes were transferred, because read has as a parameter number of bytes that were read to a buffer. And he, did use, he displayed uh, like a progress bar for the copy command in Linux. In Linux, you don't have a progress bar in the copy command. But you can actually implement one using S trace. OK, so let's start. Uh, are there any questions? Yes? Uh, yes, yes, and on the slide. And I think that I will share the slides with. Uh, in BAL, and there will be a recording, so yes. Yes? Do you have a good, a good way of getting S trace into the into trace heart? Mm, so, not that I'm aware of, but it should be possible. There is no reason why it shouldn't be. Can you repeat the question? So, the question was can you, uh, can you import S trace, uh, S -trace information into, into flame graphs? And the answer is. I don't know, but it shouldn't be impossible in principle. So here is the here is the S cumulative runtime produced by S trace. And then you see that my program was spending 1.98 seconds in Futex. So and uh, one second was allocating memory. And we think about it, a program that was running 22 seconds and was spending uh, asking for the operating system. One second, that's a lot of time spent in the, uh, spent in the uh, memory allocation. And also uh, this Futex thing shows that there is some kind of sleeping on, the, on, the, on, on some mutexes in the code. Uh, there was a question, yes? Yeah. Uh, didn't you show that in the flame graph you only had one thread in Linux? Yes. Uh, why do you use mutex? Uh, just a second, please. So this, this time I was running with eight threads. Okay. Mm. What was the question? Uh, the question is, um, uh, in the first slide, I was using Lulish with one thread. And he noticed that the few texts, there were few, one point, two seconds was spent in few texts. 
And he was asking, why is there two seconds spent in futexes? That's a good question. And the answer is, this time I ran it with eight threads, so it's a bit different. If I was running with one thread, then the futex won't be at all on the screen. Maybe it would be like, um, uh, it would be delayed. So I'm going to do the, sh uh, just a second, LSC. Uh, build S trace out. So the uh, output of S trace is really big. And uh, the problem is that I'm not in the full screen. Let's try to put it in the full screen. So it, it, it looks better when the font is small. But for example, you see here, there is a call to open at and there is the name of the library. So you can actually see what, the, what, what libraries the dynamic linker is opening. And you can use it to debug if the program is, if the program is looking for libraries at the correct addresses. So that's one thing. You can, for example, uh, use S trace to, uh, to, uh, to gather, to, to snoop network, network information that the program is sending over the network. Although if it's encrypted information that you don't get a lot of, uh, you don't, it's not very useful unless you can decrypt it. But you can actually do all that with, with S traces. <laughs> Questions? Uh, uh, I, I'm not, I don't think so. Maybe, but I, I, I don't use, I didn't use remote machines, so I don't know. Uh, I don't think perf works remotely. It, it would be, there is not some such thing like a perf server, like there is a GDB server. So I think you would need to use the local machine, or at least SSH to a remote machine and do it there. Okay, more? Okay. Uh, the, the, <laughs> There is this Zine. So Zine is like um, e-letter. I said for girls, but it's for boys. It's really nice. Uh, and it's about s -trace. And it's really nice because it gives you all the option and it's funny. So if you like reading that stuff, it's really good. Um, um, and the last thing, last top topic I want to send, talk to you about is the hardware counters and the event counters. So again, we are talking about perf. So in the first slide, perf was counting cycles. Cycles that correspond to the runtime. But perf can count any types of events. So it can type uh, 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 count instructions, it can count uh, branch predictions, CPU migrations, context switches, and so on. So perf is a really, really versatile tool because it can count anything. The problem is what, the biggest problem with perf is not that it can count, it's what you get from those information because this information is really con uh, context dependent. The meaning on one CPU can be different than from the meaning on the other CPU. Uh, so uh, let's do an investigation. This time I'm not using Lulish. I'm using a small example uh, related to matrix multiplication. So I have this, uh, I have this, um, I have this code. So this is the code that does matrix multiplication. There are three nested loops, one over i, one over j, and one over k. And I have c here, c of i j equals c of i j plus a of i k times b of k j. So this is like a textbook matrix multiplication. So this is the first implementation. And the second implementation is uh, really similar, except that I Originally, the ordering was i, j, k, and I have here i, k, j. So I exchange the inner and the outer loop. The, the middle and the outer lo inner loop, I exchange them. And also move this initialization to other loop. Now the question is, what, what, what has changed? And let's see what, what has changed. Well, let me just show you how it works. So you just call it by using perfstat. So there are two binaries. One is the first version, the original simple version, and the one, the second version is where the middle and the inner loops were exchanged. Okay, any questions? Can yes? Can you record cache history? Yes, yes. Although if you're interested, uh, so 
uh, one of the questions I get asked a lot is that uh, I want to record cache misses and you say this program has 20% of L1 cache misses but that doesn't that doesn't mean anything because only getting the percentage it works if you have the exact same number of loads which is every time you change something it's never the same so these numbers are can actually be misleading if you are doing like if you want to understand uh, the hardware efficiency of your code you, you want to use this micro architectural uh, profilers and these profilers work they tell you where uh, so uh, they take your program run it and run it and then they tell you there are wasted slots. So wasted slots is the slots, so the cycles, the CPU was wasting, it didn't do anything. And then it can tell you how much, what percentage of slots was wasted due to LAL1 cache, L2 cache, branch prediction misses, uh, uh, dependencies and so on. So these kind of tools can actually help you and the most important is the Intel's VTune compiler. So that's the one that actually has this microarchitectural analysis if you want to do this kind of analysis and you can do it only on Intel CPU it doesn't work on ARM it doesn't work on AMD's but it's a really powerful tool if you want to understand how hardware efficient is your program in really small details okay this is done let's see what happened uh, so originally uh, the code had uh, I'm focusing here on, on three things cycles instructions and this is called instruction per cycle. So instruction per cycle tells you how many instructions are executed per cycle. Ideally, the CPU can execute four instructions per cycle, the modern uh, Intel's and AMD's CPUs. Uh, ARM can execute, the M1 chip can execute five instructions per cycle. So the, 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 the ideal version would, uh, the ideal value would be 0 0.25 instructions per cycle. But you he see here there is 1.4 instructions per cycle, which is, uh, let's say, not that hardware efficient. Now, you have this number, but you don't know why. So you don't know why, and the question is, actually, what do you want to, want to know why? You have here, uh, this is called the cycles. Cycles correspond to the time. So these are the CPU cycles. And you have instructions. Instructions is also a number, but you need to pay attention sometimes you can have a program with much more instructions that runs faster it uses less cycles because this matrix of instruction per cycle is better so the original version took 100 and, uh, cycles and 140 instructions and the modified version took uh, 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 um, just a second uh, 100 cycles and 140 instruction and the modified version took 32 cycles 32 something cycles and 71 uh, instructions. So it used two times less instructions and it was running like uh, three times faster. Now, the question is why? So when you're doing performance analysis, uh, when, you're, when you're changing something in your programs and it's becoming faster, slower, you want to pay attention to these metrics, cycles and instructions, and instruction per cycle. So these are important metrics. Um, you see here that originally it was 1.4 instruction per cycle and this is 2.17. I made a mistake uh, a moment ago. So instruction per cycle, the, the best value is 4. 4 instructions per cycle. There is another metric called cycles per instruction. Okay. So you see that this program is also much more efficient and, and um, um, where did this go? Uh -huh. And it works, it works faster. Now, the question is what happened, and to understand what happened, actually, you need to understand a lot about hardware efficiency and how the compilers works. I'm just going to explain it really quickly. Um, uh, there weren't any branches in that code. I mean, this, this is like... Uh, the code, the hot, hot loop was, didn't have any branches, so it, it's not important. It wasn't about branch misses. Um, okay, okay, just one more thing. This is the user time spent. Perf will tell you time spent in the user, user time and system time. And you see this code most of the time it's spent in the user. So it's not a problem with the operating system. You shouldn't use S trace on this. Again, the same is the lower example. Let me explain you what happened. Mm -hmm. 
So here, here is the original code. And I'm going to use the blackboard a bit. So you have three matrices, right? C, A, B, and C. Okay, so when K increases by one, what happens to A, what happens to B, what happens to C? K increases by one. Well, to C, nothing happens because I and J are constant, right? So K, K increases, but you're always hitting the same cell in the matrix, right? Okay? So if the K increases, nothing changes here. Let's see for A. A is A of A, A, A of, this is bad. So this is for A of A, K. So K increases by one and you're just moving to the next cell. Okay? You're moving cell by cell by cell and so on. Okay? So you're moving sequentially across the matrix. When you get to the end, you start from the beginning and so on. And the last one is B of, B of KJ. When you have B of KJ, what actually happens is that you're going, you're skipping, you're skipping rows. You're accessing every column. You're going column-wise in the matrix. Now, this kind of access is really inefficient. It's really, really inefficient and doesn't work. So what, when, I, when I changed, when I changed the, the middle and the innermost loop, when I exchanged them, uh, see here. So now I'm looking at the J loop, loop over J, which is the innermost. What happens when it increases by one? So when it increases by one, C moves sequentially. It goes like this. So C is now moving sequentially. What happens to A? Well, A doesn't depend of J, so it's just hitting the same cell all the time. It's a constant. And finally, you have B of KJ. B of KJ means that the program is just, again, going sequentially. So the access pattern for B and C is the same. It's sequential. And originally we have a constant sequential and then with skipping. And here we don't have skipping at all. And the fact that we don't have skipping actually was the result of much higher hardware efficiency. Now what additionally, if you saw that the cycles were down by three, but the instruction count was also down by two, I think. So why, why was that? Well, what was actually happening in, when, we, when we wrote a program like this, the, comp uh, the compiler figured out that it can use vectorization. So vectorization is like um, there are really special instructions in the CPU that can process more than one piece of data. So instead of processing, taking one double, double by double by double, and then doing uh, adding and multiplication, it takes four doubles, loads four doubles to register, performs four multiplications, then performs four stores. And when the conditions are good, like you have this sequential access, the compiler does it automatically. And this is why you have the reduced number of instructions. Okay, questions? Yes? So uh, the reason that you didn't get um, like vectorization in the first example, was it also about like the data dependency? No, no. Uh, the reason, in the, so the question was, uh, why didn't we get vectorization in the first example? The reason is that the compiler thinks that because you have these column-wise accesses, that the vectorization won't be efficient. And when there is a cost model in compiler, and when it figures out that the vectorization won't be efficient, it doesn't vectorize. It uses the scalar code. And you can see that in the instruction count. Yes? Uh, the question is, can the compiler do this optimization automatically for us? In my experience, I only saw Intel compiler does that, but I don't think many people use the Intel compiler. The Clang has a loop interchange pass, which is disabled, so you need to enable it explicitly. But even if you enable it, it doesn't guarantee this, this will happen. Questions? Why did page 12 go significantly into the second Let's see. So we have 8,577. They didn't grow, they're roughly the same. Uh, the context switches. Uh, 
uh, uh, that's because the runtime was faster. So the program was, was yeah, it was running faster, so it, but the number, the total number was the same. One important thing, let's say, these context switches. So the number of context switches is uh, also important metric. If you see this number high, then that means you have a contention on mutexes. Because like the CPU is just interacting tra threads because they are locked on mutexes. So this is indication that, that there is a problem with mutexes. Yes? Uh -huh. So the question is, are the context switches recorded only on the th program's threads and not the, all the threads in the system? Yes, they're recorded only on the threads that belong to the program. Questions? I think we're done. So I think explained. Okay, that was all about the tools. I hope you have a good time. Uh, I, want to ex I want to tell you what I didn't talk about here and I think also it's really useful. Um, first thing is the data flow analysis. So imagine like this, you have your programs and you're debugging and you see some wrong value. I see a wrong value here. The question is where, where, did, the, where did this bad value come from? And then you try, start debugging and it went here, here and then here and then you slowly get to the place where, where this bad value happened. But what you can use as a tool to do that? And actually there is a tool, it's called Pernosco. Um, Pernosco, it's a uh, it's really nice tool because there is this tool you record the, the behavior of proof program and it generalizes this visual, visual, operation, uh, visual report and you click on, on your bad value and then you see how it moved from one variable to another, from one register to another. So it's really useful for debugging this kind of stuff. Then we didn't talk about debugging tools, so you have Valgrind, you have various sanitizers. These are used to catch memory corruptions, stack corruptions, that kind of stuff. Uh, you have Hellgrind, which is used to, de to detect thread races. Uh, you, was, you have reverse debuggers. So reverse debugger actually allows you to record your program, how it executes, and then you can use step back. You're just going back in time. So you have like next, 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 but you have reverse next. You have step, but you have reverse step. You have uh, continue, but you have reverse continue as well. Um, yeah, those are the debuggers. I didn't talk about them, and I think it would be a really good, nice thing to hear for all the people that are debugging code all the time. Now, there is also one thing that people fail to do, is like when they're writing their codes, they don't think about the debuggability and observability. So you want to write your code that it's easy to observe and easy to debug. And one of the things that actually really useful if you think about it, is, uh, if you have counters in your program. Let's say your program is uh, passing some data from one thread to another thread. And if you have counters that counts how many types of messages was generated in this thread. And uh, how many, uh, so you can see peaks, if you can visualize them, you can see peaks where, <coughs> peaks, you can see if the, 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 the rate of generation was high or something unusual was happening in the system. And actually, if you're a hardware development, this is all you have. You only have counters. You can read various counters about, vari about various events in the system, but you don't have like, a, you cannot go everywhere and, and, and read anything. That's one thing that often misses in the programs. And the second is the data flow debug IDs. So data flow debug IDs is like, you have several threads. One trend is producing data, going to a second, going to a third, going to a fourth, and so on. Now you have problems in the fourth thread, and you need to figure out what, where did it come from. So you should have some kind of IDs that you can use in various places. You can use in various places to track where the data originated from. Like a debug information, which is not essential for your data processing, but this is essential and really easy for debugging. And then you just print out all the, in all the stages you can print out information and then you will have, you, will, you can really easily and quickly figure out where the bad, bad value came from. Okay, questions? Yes? Hey, one thing, if uh, you're developing specifically for Intel architectures, mm -hmm. would you recommend their tools or even if you Yes, yes. I know from my experience they can uh, deliver an incredible 
Yes, yes, but th th these are the best tools we have. I mean, AMD's ARM are not are, are, are not even close to their to their tools. Questions? Okay, thank you very much.